Police in Hong Kong are warning people not to take part in a vigil commemorating the June massacre in Beijing 32 years ago. For a second year running, authorities have banned the event, citing COVID-19 restrictions. Asia correspondent Adrian Brown joins me live. Adrian, what can you tell us about this event commemorating Tiananmen Square? What happened last year? Well, last year, this event was also banned by the police, citing the same reason COVID-19, but up until then, the event had taken place every year for the past 30 years. Now, it is a very, you know, sensitive moment for, for China's government as well as Hong Kong's government as it becomes more closely aligned with the government on the mainland. But the police are saying that this is an event which put, could possibly uh, contravene the new national security law that was imposed on Hong Kong uh, just under a year ago, because some of the organizers of this group are openly calling for the end to one party rule in China. So the police are using the excuse of COVID-19 to, to ban this commemoration, but it seems the real reason is politics, because, you know, we have only had one untraceable infection of COVID-19 in Hong Kong during the past 38 days. Basically, the city is back to normal. Uh, sports events are taking place. Restaurants are open. Shopping malls are open. So this seems to be down to politics. Now, China says that Hong Kong's freedoms are, are guaranteed. They remain intact. And a lot of commentators are saying, if that's the case, the best way for Beijing to demonstrate that is to allow this commemoration to take place. It is an extremely taboo issue, though. I mean... The events of 1989 are not discussed in China. The uh, vigil, the comm commemoration is not reflected in any way on the mainland. And, of course, there's been no official accounting into the events of what happened there on June the 4th, 1989. You heard earlier on from, from Joe Biden talking about that dreadful racially motivated attack in Tulsa 100 years ago in the United States. They address those issues in China. That doesn't happen. It's something that is forgotten about. It's, it's airbrushed from history. Indeed, airbrushed from the internet as well and any access to it if you are on mainland China. Now, Adrian, this comes at a pretty sensitive time, not just as we see China uh, trying to expand its influence, but a significant year for the Chinese Communist Party. Absolutely right. Uh, the Communist Party is 100 years old, and this means the party is in triumphal mood right now. It is focusing on the positive. It is not accentuating the negative. That means events like what happened in Beijing 32 years ago, the protests in Hong Kong two years ago, the terrible calamities under Chairman Mao, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, when tens of thousands of people die. These are events which will not be dwelled on. You know, Communist Party history is very, very selective. And this year, this time, the party is focusing on how, you know, tens of millions of people have been lifted from poverty. And that is true. China's made great advances also with its space program. But it has to address some of the negative. And these are issues that children in schools simply will not be told about. Indeed. One interesting development this week, indeed, China's infam infamous one-child policy. It was a couple of years ago it turned into a two-child policy and now a three-child policy. What's behind the timing of the decision, do you think? Well, Laura, I think it seems to me like a bit of an alert, an alarm, a sort of recognition the one-child policy and the two-child policy have failed. But the problem is this. If you look at the comments on social media, particularly on Weibo, which is China's heavily censored version of Twitter, there has been a real outpouring of negativity. People are saying this is too little, too late. We can't afford to have two children, let alone three. And let's remember, this decision has been taken by the highest body in the land, the Politburo Standing Committee, and that comprises all men. These are not men who have any experience of, you know, changing a nappy, and yet they're now telling women to go forth and, and multiply. And, and, and the government agency in charge of that is the same agency that was responsible for, you know, the forced abortions and sterilizations 
that took place against people who contravened the one-child policy. And, of course, it's particularly sad for people who are now in their 50s and 60s who wanted to have more than one child 20 years ago, let's say, and are now no longer able to. The fertility rate in China at the moment is about 1.3 children per woman. Uh, that is very low. That is on a par with both South Korea and Japan. And the falling birth rate means that, of course, it's going to potentially affect the labor market. And that's why China is now investing so much money in things like robotics, to have machines in factories, because they don't have the workers they need. It could import workers, of course, from neighboring countries, but China's leaders mm -hmm. feel that that poses a potential, you know, security problem. Not exactly a switch you can just flick on and off, is no, it, Adrian? Thanks indeed. so much no. for your time. As always, we'll speak to you soon.